Wir haben noch ein paar Minuten. Ja, ja. Vielleicht noch ein bisschen Zeit zugeben.
Get started. Welcome everyone to the Wilson Center. Um, I'm Christian Osterman. I have the privilege of directing the Global Europe program here at the center. Mm -hmm. and it's a pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to our institution um, and to this um, uh, session on um, the Eastern Partnership, um, a session that we're uh, happy to uh, co-sponsor with our colleagues from the Kennan, the Center's Kennan Institute, um, Matt Rogensky, directors all the way in the back, um, uh, and a uh, uh, warm welcome also on their behalf. Um, this morning, so this afternoon's session will be on um, the uh, recent EU progress report on the Eastern Partnership um, States, um, and we're delighted to have um, Klaus Botzet, the head of the EU delegation's political section here with us today um, at this pivotal moment um, in uh, the uh, Eastern Partnership um, and the EU's relations um, with um, uh, the countries of the Eastern Partnership and, of course, against the backdrop of the crisis in Ukraine. So we're very much looking forward to uh, his remarks. Let me just uh, introduce him briefly. Uh, he has a long and distinguished CV to his credit. I won't uh, uh, read all of it, just to say that uh, he joined the delegation here in Washington as head of the political section in um, uh, just just last uh, month, uh, he is uh, one of uh, Germany's most distinguished um, uh, uh, diplomats. Um, uh, uh, he uh, was at the Foreign Office in Berlin um, for the last three years uh, as director, head of the division of U.S. Uh, Canada Affairs, uh, responsible for monitoring and advising on German and EU relations with the United States and Canada. Um, prior uh, to that, he was legal advisor and consul general at the German embassy in Washington, so he's, uh, this is familiar stomping ground for him, um, where he was responsible for all legal matters and affairs in bilateral relations. Um, prior to that, he served as a transatlantic diplomatic fellow, um, a, senior, a senior exchange diplomat at the Department of State from 2008 to 2009. Um, and earlier postings include uh, the German permanent mission at the, uh, to the UN in Geneva, the Chancellor's Office uh, in Bonn, the EU Department at the Foreign Office in Bonn, as well as the uh, Economic Department at, uh, of the German Embassy in Bogota, Colombia, and uh, at the Economic um, Section of the Foreign Office. Um, so it's uh, uh, with great uh, pleasure that uh, I welcome him, and uh, you have the floor, Klaus. Thank you very much, Christian, uh, for your kind words of welcome. Uh, when I accepted this invitation, I thought, hmm, you could have probably chosen an easier subject for your first speech at the Wilson Center uh, in this new function. Uh, of course, Eastern Europe and Ukraine in particular are uh, on our minds very much and in the news uh, uh, on top of the priority list, as we all know. Uh, I propose to you to uh, make some introductory remarks and then I'm looking forward to questions uh, from the floor. Um, Ukraine, Eastern Europe is for Europe currently the most important foreign policy challenge also here in Washington, Ukraine has been very much on top of the political agenda now for something like two months. The European neighborhood policy, the ENP, is in fact a very good opportunity to demonstrate what the European project means for the EU's neighbors. The ENP and the Eastern Partnership policy the EU has developed is inclusive and not divisive. It is about creating open and free democratic societies. It is not about creating new or destroying former or perceived zones of influence. The ENP is about giving countries and their people choices and opportunities for their future. It's not about dominating them. Ladies and gentlemen, the events that trouble us so much today in Ukraine were actually triggered by the prospect of Ukraine signing the association agreement with the EU. 
followed a series of events that led to the most tense and difficult situation in Europe since the end of the Cold War. The Eastern Partnership policy is therefore obviously politically very relevant. Let me briefly recall some of its major elements. The ENP has most importantly a political and a economic pillar. The third is about migration and mobility and sector cooperation which benefit directly uh, the citizens of uh, the partnership countries. The political pillar aims at creating deep and sustainable democracies in the partnership countries. We are talking about free and fair elections on a regular, recurrent basis. We are talking about fundamental freedoms like the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly and the respect for the rule of law. The fight against corruption and reforms of the police and the justice system to restore public confidence and accountability are essential aspects of this element. Strengthening civil society is just as important. The second pillar of the Eastern Partnership and the European Neighborhood Policy is the economic pillar. Economic growth in most partner countries unfortunately remained weak in the reporting period, also due to a lack of progress on structural reforms. The EU Commission holds perma and permanent dialogue with the partner countries that benefit from EU macrofinancial assistance in order to lead them to growth-oriented structural reforms. The programs emphasize private sector development, which is a key to inclusive economic growth and job creation. Developing a vibrant private sector, in particular by fostering small and medium-sized enterprises, can not only improve the economy, but also strengthen better governance and democracy. The EU supports inclusive economic development through SME, small and medium-sized enterprise development, infrastructure development, and job training through a range of policy initiatives and financial support. Boosting trade with the EU is, of course, a major hope for the Eastern Partnership countries. The association agreements include deep and comprehensive free trade agreements, and they are an important tool in this regard. They are also powerful tools beyond liberalizing trade. Such association agreements were recently finalized with Moldova and Georgia. And this is one of the most positive results of the Eastern Partnership policy of the EU highlighted in the progress report. These two countries have made good progress and are moving ahead further. The protracted negotiations with re Ukraine under the former Yanukovych government over the association agreement are a long story. Yanukovych finally decided to suspend the negotiations and this led to the overwhelming peaceful demonstrations on the Maidan and ultimately to the collapse, uh, collapse of the Yanukovych government. After the Ukrainian government has changed, the EU and Ukraine have decided to immediately put into force the political clauses of the association agreement. So this is the first pillar I spoke about. The negotiations on the economic part shall be concluded as soon as possible after the presidential elections in Ukraine on May 25. As the EU high rep EU's High Representative Lady Ashton has said, the solution for Ukraine is political and economic. Supporting Ukraine to be a viable economic and democratic state that can respond to the needs of his people is a top priority for the EU and the West altogether. Ladies and gentlemen, the EU's political message on Ukraine is clear and unambiguous. It has been reiterated now at the Foreign Affairs Council meeting uh, this Monday, uh, April 14. The EU condemns the actions taken by armed individuals in cities of eastern Ukraine. These attempts at destabilizing Ukraine must come to an end. 
the EU strongly supports Ukraine's territorial integrity, sovereignty, and independence, and calls upon Russia to do likewise and repudiate the latest lawless acts in eastern Ukraine. It demands Russia to withdraw its troops from the Ukrainian border. Any threat or use of force against Ukraine or any other countries is not acceptable and must stop immediately. The EU strongly condemns the illegal annexation of Crimea and Sevastopol and uh, by the Russian Federation and will not recognize it. The EU Council has decided to expand the list of those subjects to asset freeze and visa ban, and we understand that also the US administration is preparing additional sanctions if Russia does not de-escalate the situation. The EU stands to its commitment to provide strong financial and economic support to Ukraine for its economic and financial stabilization. The IMF support is also critical in this regard. The EU Council adopted the decision on the macro-financial assistance for Ukraine, which raises the total number up to 1.6 billion euros. The whole assistance package announced by the EU Commission on March 5 will bring overall support of the EU for Ukraine to uh, 11 billion euros over the next years. So that's about roughly 13 to 14 billion US dollars. The money is coming from the EU budget and EU-based financial institutions. Very importantly, the Council also adopted a regulation on the elimination or reduction of custom duties on goods from Ukraine pending the signature and provisional application of the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement until November 1st in this year. Ladies and gentlemen, so much at the moment on the actual EU support to Ukraine. Let me also briefly touch upon the other six countries in the Eastern Partnership Program. The Progress Report adopts key recommendations for the Eastern Partnership countries and highlights positive developments in each country as well as gives further recommendations. I already mentioned the association agreements with Moldova and with Georgia that were initialed at the summit in Vilnius in November last year. Georgia has acted on most of the recommendations and also Moldova has addressed many of them. Now preparations are made to sign the agreements and we are doing everything to ensure that this happens by June this year. The negotiations on an association agreement with Armenia were completed last year. However, this agreement could not be initialed because of Armenia's decision in September 2013 to join the Eurasian Union comprising Russia, Belarus and Kazakhstan. However, Armenia has addressed some of the key recommendations of the last European Neighborhood Policy Progress Report on elections, on corruption, and on human rights. The EU will continue to provide assistance to Armenia for such reforms, of course. Progress was made also on association agreement with Azerbaijan after the country has acted on some of the key recommendations. It partly addressed public financial management issues and took some measures to fight corruption. The EU is now ready to launch negotiations on a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement uh, as part of an association agreement following Azerbaijan's accession to the WTO. Unfortunately, uh, Belarus made no progress in political reforms. When you're interested into more detailed information, the specific country reports go into great detail. And please understand, I cannot cover, excuse me, cannot uh, cover here all the details at this occasion. Um, f you're very much welcome for specific information uh, to consult the official EU's website, uh, which is the European Neighborhood Info Center web portal. Uh, this is www.enpi-info-eu, repeat, www 
period EMPI dash info uh, period EU. This website provides you with up to date information in four languages on cooperation projects in the Eastern neighborhood countries. And please let me conclude on a more personal note. Um, when the people on the Maidan in Kiev demanded democracy, the rule of law, and an end to corruption, they were waving European flags by the hundreds, if not by the thousands. And these pictures went around the world. People in Eastern Europe know an individual can go anywhere. A country can move to European standards, can go the way of open, democratic, and inclusive societies. This promise is open to every country in the region and beyond. This is what the European partnership policy is truly about, and the EU will live up to this promise. The folks on the streets of Kiev and all over the region know this and wave their European flag. I must admit, it makes me a little bit proud. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Um, let me, before um, we go into Q&A, um, which I'm sure will, will, where Ukraine will come up, ask you a little bit, um, you, in, in terms of um, uh, uh, progress in, in Azerbaijan, you sort of went straight uh, to the um, uh, free trade um, agreement and the economic uh, trade issues. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, uh, the situation, the political situation and the progress um, in Azerbaijan on, on, on the human rights and, um, and other related issues? Uh, I must admit I'm not an Azerbaijan expert. However, um, if I recall this part of the, the report correctly, there are still uh, a number of recommendations uh, that have been made from the EU side that were not yet taken up by the Azerbaijani side. So um, the decision has to been made to focus on uh, the trade side um, and uh, as soon as Azerbaijan exceeds to the WTO, um, we can move ahead on the trade side, uh, hoping that we can also make uh, progress on the political side. Okay. Well, let's open it up for, for Q&A and your comments. Uh, if you uh, could, please, in Wilson Center tradition, uh, state your name and wait for the, uh, the microphone before uh, speaking up. So who's, who's first? Do that good down here. <coughs> Uh, Dieter Detke, Georgetown University. Uh, thank you very much, and I uh, certainly agree with you that the Maidan demonstrations were a huge compliment for Europe, no doubt about it. But um, I want to ask you a, a more critical question because, you know, as we speak here today, Ukrainian troops move against the occupation activities in eastern Ukraine. And as we know from Clausewitz, war always begins with an act of defense. And that's what's happening now. So, you know, we could face a very, very serious situation. And, and my question is, and I don't want to be too critical, but, but my question is, did the EU maybe make a mistake in putting the uh, association agreement in terms of an either-or situation with the Eurasian Union? And the source for this is, of course, uh, Commission President Barroso, who exactly said, you know, it's either or. Would you maybe um, tell us a little bit more? Wasn't that perhaps too much pressure on Ukraine, a Huntington calls it a cleft country that has definitely a part in its uh, boundaries that are of a different cultural nature, and 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 do you see some mistakes that maybe have been made uh, in uh, in that situation to you know put the association agreement in these categorical terms? Either you join us, or you go the other way, which is the Putin way. 
I know, uh, you know, it is a critical question, that, but I would like to hear you about this, whether, you know, we could have done a better job, because as you see the consequences now, I mean, I wonder what the EU will be able to do under the circumstances, and uh, that worries me a little bit. Thank you. Thank you for this very interesting question. Um, and I believe there is a, a fundament, fundamental misunderstanding. One should not confuse the association agreement and the deep and comprehensive fr free trade agreement. Uh, uh, President Barroso's remarks uh, refer to the free trade agreement. And there, indeed, you cannot have uh, uh, both cannot have two sets of custom duties in the same country on the same product. It's either or. Either you are a member of uh, uh, the customs union and then you have one set of custom duties or you're a member of the free trade uh, agreement and the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement with the EU, then you have another one. It's either or. It's like a traffic light. It cannot be red and green at the same time. Um, the association agreement is a much broader scope, uh, as I have tried to line out. Uh, and that's not neither or. And the association agreement and the Eastern uh, Partnership Policy has always been open from the beginning on open to Russia as well. And it politely declined and said, no, we are a uh, strategic partner of the EU. We w do not want to enter into these negotiations. But the concept of the association agreement is, as I said, inclusive. And it does not in exclude anybody if we uh, try from the EU side to promote the conditions for an uh, open and democratic society. Uh, there is no way this can be interpreted into any divisive action. Um, the, the trade rules are a different matter, and there a, a decision needs to be made what you want. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, gentleman over here. Hello, Paul Lewis from The Guardian newspaper. Um, I have two questions. First, uh, there are the four-way talks tomorrow in Geneva. And I wanted to ask you what you thought could plausibly be achieved uh, from those talks of which the EU is a part. And then the second question, there's obviously some divisions, differences among uh, European countries about when and how uh, to escalate sanctions. Um, and I wondered if you could explain the source of those differences as you see them. Well, as it has been said, we are now in a very serious situation. There can be no doubt about it. And uh, uh, many hopes lie on this meeting tomorrow in Geneva. Um, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, we will need to see what comes out of it. Hopefully, a de-escalation of the situation and a way forward. Uh, but again, I, I cannot predict the outcome of this meeting. And um, on the sanctions policy, as you know, there has been uh, no decision made in Europe currently. And uh, I also there again cannot uh, predict uh, how uh, the debate will be going. It's a very democratic way. Um, of decision making and that uh, by its nature implies that there are different opinions and um, uh, very m much how this debate will be going will depend from the meeting tomorrow in Geneva, certainly. Yep, front here. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Sabrina Scher from the Mercator Fellowship. Um, my question is actually quite short. Uh, how do you think will the Ukraine-Russia crisis impact the EU's partnership with Moldova, especially uh, given the status of the region of Transnistria? Thank you. I shall answer right away. Um, 
the EU and Moldova will, will move ahead and with a view to signing the uh, association agreement this year. Uh, uh, the uh, targeted day is sometime before June. Uh, and this is the clear intention of the, the EU to, to go ahead in this way. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Cornelius Adebar from the Carnegie Endowment. Uh, welcome to Washington, uh, Mr. Um, uh, this is about the progress of the ENP, and um, I think if you compare um, the, say, the image of the ENP a year ago to today, um, there is progress in the sense that the policy is apparently so substantial that it has caused this major crisis, if you take uh, Ukraine. Um, I want to look a little bit in the future um, and uh, see what uh, the, the point that, that Mr. Detke raised about the compatibility of uh, a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement uh, and the, the customs union, because it seems that despite Barroso's very firm statement from last year, now there is more openness also on the EU side to see whether there is compatibility, whether there is a way to combine um, the uh, demands of the, of the association agreement and the, the free trade agreement uh, with Europe uh, with whatever Russia wants. And also the, um, the foreign ministers of the Weimar Triangle, they proposed uh, to take more into account, very careful wording, but to take more into account the views of the neighbors of the neighbors. Uh, which reads Russia. Um, so I would like to hear from you, is this, is, what is the, the thinking that uh, there should be more flexibility on the EU side, taking more into account the concerns from Russia? Um, is this also something that the neighborhood countries want? Uh, does Armenia want uh, Russia to be more taken into account? Does Moldova want Russia to be more taken into account? Um, where do we go from here uh, in, in this sense? Thank you very much. It's an interesting question um, um, whether uh, there can be some flexibility on some tariff lines. I must say I haven't seen any information in this regard. Uh, uh, I'm sure people in Brussels will be looking at that very closely. Uh, the general line, as I said, uh, is on the other hand, you cannot have two different sets of rules of, of custom duties on the same product. You cannot have, uh, excuse me? Maybe you can differentiate the products. If you can, I'm, I'm sure if, if there are possibilities, there is the willingness to look at it, seriously. Uh, but cars are cars, and you can have customs duties either of three or five or 15 percent, but you cannot have it both. Um, uh, so that's the difficulty we are facing here. I cannot speak for Russia. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, Brian Beery, Washington correspondent for Europolitics. I've also got a question on, uh, it's more Moldova focused. Um, Article 49, I believe, of the EC Treaty says that any European country can apply for EU membership. And the government of Moldova has been strongly saying that it would like to join the EU. And yet the EU28 have refused to say that explicitly that Moldova has uh, a perspective of joining the EU. Why is the EU28 so reluctant to, to give uh, a country like Moldova that perspective? And has the Ukraine crisis changed views within Europe on that issue? Thank you. Um, we're currently looking at the step, the, the important step of the association agreement. Um, as I said, this is composed of different parts, the political part, the economic part, uh, the migration part. Uh, this will bring uh, the participating countries, uh, without doubt, uh, closer to the EU and its standards. Um, the association agreement uh, agreements do not prejudge whether uh, a country 
that signs it and uh, engages in the process can become EU member at at a later stage. As you know, for EU membership, uh, the Copenhagen summit uh, uh, some 20 years ago uh, or longer has set up a number of criteria, and these are the conditions uh, which will then uh, be looked at if if a country uh, applies for membership. And uh, uh, the association agreement certainly moves the partner countries closer the, to the EU and uh, helps them to uh, come closer in this sense. Um, there is no formal decision made, as far as I know, and the future is always open. So um, I, I uh, for the moment, I cannot take uh, any position to on this in the sense it's uh, prejudged in one way or the other. Okay. Yes. <coughs> Hi, I'm Mark Kaufman. I'm with the World Movement for Democracy. Uh, my question has to do with, uh, and I'm not an EU or an Eastern Europe uh, expert, but based on your presentation, you talked about um, this division between the economic and the political. And for example, when you talked about Azerbaijan, you said that there's been progress on the economic side, but not so much on the political side. My question has to do with the relationship between these two. So, for example, is it the view that the more progress that's made and the drawing into Europe on the economic side will produce results on the political side, so we should keep pushing on the economic side? Or, on the other hand, would, you, would the EU hold back on the economic side as a way to send a message about the political side? I mean, how do you balance these two in terms of the negotiations? Thank you. I'll answer right away. Um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the EU wants progress on both sides, obviously, and uh, some countries are moving quicker on the political side, which is well, the way Ukraine now uh, seems to take. And uh, Azerbaijan is more um, on the economic side, and we see this as. Uh, a system which is interrelated. Uh, economic freedom implies personal freedom to some extent, uh, implies also uh, a very important political freedoms like the uh, freedom of opinion, freedom of taking the economic decisions. Um, ultimately, uh, we believe you cannot uh, have a working free market economy without personal liberties. And, and so uh, the one impacts the other. Now, how far this goes um, uh, needs to be evaluated on each individual case. You cannot uh, uh, take a general line on this. Um, the EU is looking. Uh, at each country, assess its, its progress. That's what this report is about, and uh, decides about the next step. And um, uh, on Azerbaijan, this decision has been made. If the country uh, exceeds to WTO, we can enter into uh, DCFTA negotiations. And Hopefully, this will also have a very positive effects on the political reforms um, this country takes. Um, they are responsive, in a way, to uh, the suggestions made by the EU, as some of the reform steps uh, they have taken show. And these are encouraging signs, and that's the basis on which we are operating. Thank you. All the way in the back. <clears throat> Thank you very much. My name is Agron Alibale. I am a scholar here. Um, the EU has played a very positive and uh, interesting role with respect to 
the relationship between Serbia and Kosovo. Now, in the Eastern Partnership Initiative, you have very, two very important countries, Armenia and Azerbaijan, that have a major problem with the, uh, there. Uh, how do you think the Eastern Partnership Initiative will help tackle the problem of Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh? Thank you. The Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is unfortunately a long-standing conflict, uh, one of those frozen conflicts um, we're observing and many attempts are being made to defreeze it and find a solution. Um, if we um, succeed in um, economic development of the region and uh, a political opening of the countries, uh, this will also have positive impact, certainly, on, on the conflict you mentioned here. Um, it's long overdue that this conflict is resolved in an amicable way, and hopefully the ENP policy uh, contributes to that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Lauren. I'm a research fellow at U.S. Azari Network. So you briefly mentioned the need for economic development in uh, the in Eastern Europe as well as um, development of economic relations between Eastern Europe and Europe. Uh, recently, um, Sokar, an Azerbaijani gas company, has been constructing a pipeline from Azerbaijan to Europe uh, that's supposed to be completed in 2018, and it will supply up to 60 BCM of gas from Eastern Europe to to Europe. How do you see this impacting the economic, the development of economic relations between these two regions and um, what the political implications of that might be? Thank you very much um, for opening up the debate a little bit and, and pointing to uh, energy as a very important factor uh, in the current situation, energy supply uh, and energy security. Um, this was also an issue that was discussed uh, at the recent EU-US summit in Brussels. Um, the pipeline you mentioned will contribute to uh, the diversification of the EU's energy supply and um, also uh, of the energy supply of its neighbors. Um, it's, as you also make clear in your question, it's uh, nothing which can be done overnight. Um, it takes years to make the necessary technical installations, um, but it helps pretty much um, to avoid that energy supply can be used as uh, a, a political tool and an instrument of pressure, and that's very important. Thank you. Yeah, in the back. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Dominic Toksov. I'm a fellow at the U.S. Institute of Peace. I have just a very few questions. First of all, on the association agreement with Ukraine, um, um, which has been uh, signed uh, recently, how much, um, how much, like, I would like to, to know a little bit about the discussions in Brussels, because the government is not um, regarded very legitimate in, in, in Ukraine. And was it, do you think it was a little bit too, too, too quick to sign that agreement before the presidential elections? Um, secondly, on Moldova, I don't know, um, shouldn't the EU, after the experience with um, Ukraine, be a little bit more cautious? Because also in uh, Moldova the situation is kind of divided between those people that want to have closer relations with Russia and the EU. And here, shouldn't we be a little bit more cautious about also how to handle, handle Moldova? And lately, uh, the last question um, about Azerbaijan. Uh, here again, um, the, you said that the EU is at the moment preparing a DCFTA with Azerbaijan, but I wonder like, how, much, how much support is there in the country for, for, for a DCFTA with, uh, with the EU because it implies or it includes all these kind of conditions set by the EU. How much, I mean, how much willingness is there on, on, the, on the side of uh, the, the government to really increase its uh, relations with the EU? Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, I'd like to come back to, to my initial remarks at the outset. Uh, the neighborhood policy is about economically stabilizing the partnership countries and helping them on the way to become open and democratic societies. Uh, that's what the association agreements are about. And I think you cannot start early enough if the political will willingness is there to do it. And uh, that's we got this signal from Moldova, and uh, that is why we're wor uh, going this way. Um, there can be no doubt that uh, the people in this country want to go the way other European countries have gone. They travel. Uh, people from Ukraine and, and Moldova travel westwards and see uh, how uh, accession agreements and later EU membership has benefited countries like Poland and Slovakia and Czechia and Hungary, uh, how dynamic the, the uh, economic and develop, uh, political development um, has been there, and that's the way they want to go. Uh, they're direct neighbors, and I think um, uh, we should proceed in this neighborhood policy with the steps we are on outlining. Again, it's in, an ex inclusive policy. Nobody needs to be afraid of uh, a country being becoming more democratic. Nobody needs to be afraid of a country becoming less corrupt in its institutions. And if somebody is, there is something wrong. It's easy, as easy as that. The question also referred to the uh, support in Azerbaijan for... Yes, I said I, I come back to earlier remarks there. Um, it's a system of communicating pipes. If we can make uh, progress on the economic side, uh, we believe there will be also an impact on the political side and vice versa. And um, uh, as there has been some response by the government in Azerbaijan on some of the recommendations, we see this as an encouraging political sign. And of course, uh, the situation will be closely and objectively monitored also in the future. Um. Okay, thank you. We'll go up front here and then the gentleman there. <coughs> My name is Joan Ackerholm. I recently repatriated back to the U.S after completing my tenure as Deputy Director of the Carnegie Moscow Center. Uh, Mr. Botset, you had talked about the uh, partnership covering two pillars, political and economic. I'd like to concentrate a bit on the political pillar. You said that it covers free elections, democ democracies, establishing open and free societies, rule of law, and strengthening of civil society, and I might add, conflict mitigation, maybe some training, and that would be uh, greatly needed at this point. Given all of these elements, and given that Ukraine has benefited from development and technical assistance for maybe 20 years from the U.S. and from the EU and other organizations, right now with this situation and going forward, hopefully we can go forward, where do you see the areas of greatest need on the political pillar in terms of all of these areas. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in Ukraine, we must certainly see that the former government, the Yanukovych government, was not interested in undertaking any political reforms. So the, the new government and uh, the provisional government, as well as after the, the elections on, in May, the new government basically starts from scratch in building uh, reliable institutions uh, uh, in which citizens can put their trust in, in uh, uh, building up the country again, uh, fighting corruption, 
uh, breaking up economic uh, monopolies that have made s a few people very rich and uh, uh, impoverished the country otherwise. Um, so um, where we are with Ukraine at the moment, it, the situation is simply uh, the economic situation is very serious. The fiscal needs are enormous, and this is what we are focusing on. Uh, I believe it's very encouraging that the um, the way that the provisional government is addressing all issues at the same time in a very serious manner. It's something we haven't seen from uh, in Ukraine before. It's very encouraging. Uh, the seriousness in the population of going this route and uh, putting confidence in, in the new government in this sense. And they deserve the full support from everybody, from the EU and beyond, from the United States. And, and then uh, it, it can be a very become a very positive story, but the situation at the moment is serious. Yep, the gentleman in the back. <coughs> My name's Thomas Grindley. There's been considerable discussion in the press comparing Russian actions in Georgia and Ukraine. Does the European Union have similar positions regarding the parts of Georgia which have become separated from Georgia and Crimea, which has become separated from Ukraine. Um, I've already said the European doesn't European Union does not recognize the annexation uh, of Crimea, and it does not recognize uh, the uh, regions that have separated from. Georgia. So, uh, in a way, uh, yes, there uh, are similarities in, in this extent. Um, does that answer your question? Any other questions um, for our guest? We're close to our ending time, but there's time for one more question. Otherwise, I would like to ask you, could you talk a little bit about um, um, US-EU coordination as you've been observing it for the last um, few weeks here on, uh, on Ukraine uh, and um, Eastern Partnership Matters? I must uh, say I'm impressed how, how close the coordination is at um, all levels, in particular at the top level, um, it's um, a permanent flow of communication back and forth and a very serious exchange um, of thoughts and analysis, um, uh, which shows how uh, very much Europeans and Americans are on the same page on these issues. This is now uh, a very serious situation about uh, preserving the progress that has been made in the past 25 uh, years um, in building a uh, fr free and democratic uh, countries uh, east of the former Iron Curtain and um, it's encouraging to s for me to see as a diplomat how, how close this cooperation is and how uh, dense the contacts are. Where, where would you see the, um, the, the main differences in the EU and US approach at the moment? I'd say it's... Um, At the moment, I don't see actually major differences. Uh, the uh, hope here, as in in Europe, are uh, is that we um, 
come to um, an outcome tomorrow in Geneva where we go move to a de-escalation scenario, a scenario which uh, allows for uh, a peaceful resolution of the conflict and a, a peaceful way forward uh, to allow Ukraine a stable political development and uh, solve this uh, situation in a positive way, but it always needs two to tango, and Russia is the other one who n needs to uh, play a positive role in this peace. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, invite all of you before um, closing to uh, join us on May 5th for the 2014 Atisari Symposium on uh, European security and global perspective. We have uh, our distinguished scholar, uh, uh, Ambassador Wolfgang Ischinger, who will be joining us uh, later this month here. The chairman, of course, of the Munich Security Conference uh, will give the keynote at the symposium, and uh, then there'll be a, a luncheon afterwards with President Atisari. And uh, all of you are invited um, if uh, there'll be invitations uh, forthcoming soon, and um, we hope to see you there. Um, with that, let me also thank uh, our uh, guest speaker, Klaus Botzett, for um, uh, coming here, joining us, and uh, uh, fielding um, questions at uh, this uh, obviously very sensitive time on, uh, uh, on, on sensitive subjects, as uh, obviously we're facing um, you know, a warlike situation in, in, uh, in Ukraine. So thank you, and uh, let's join for a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.